we're live whenever you want to watch. So. All right. Yeah, I don't just think to the garage I, the, I was just airport. I was just going to make a comment about this is for the dunces in the class, and you come sit down. <laughs> you might want to move. I wanted to be the taxi driver. <laughs> An icon. <laughs> All right, y'all. <clears throat> this is interesting. You know, it must be, it's either getting deep or boring because everybody's moving back. Quick escape out the door if you need to. Uh, anyway, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, who at the feast of the Passover didst give unto the world the medicine of salvation. Increase, we beseech thee, the use of all these thy saving remedies among thy people, that they may be healed of spiritual ills and endued with the quickening power of life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Well, it was it was asked me why the chairs were up here and this is this is the dunces corner so if you get the dunce cap i'm sort of walk around you know and sort of like musical chairs just well, drop it off that case. <laughs> good priest always knows himself <laughs> i want to talk today from what saint john has to say saint john of Cronstadt has to say about the priest in temptation uh, and again, he's, he's addressing clergy, but it really what he says applies to all of us if we get serious about what it is we're, we are expected to be by God uh, as part of our order in creation. And we have to refer back to the temple, the ancient temple and the temple clergy for three aspects that, that get omitted, I think, or ignored when people look at the ancient temple. Uh, one of those temptations of the ancient and tempt, the temptations that face the clergy. I'm getting some echo here, okay, uh, in the temple. One was carelessness in their duties. Now, you have to understand the temple was a, a, it was, it was a mass of people and things were going on constantly in movement and there was no structured, not strictly structured order. That, like there wasn't the high priest here and a row of acolytes here and there. The, the Western Rite is very ordered compared to what the ancient temple used to be. Orthodoxy is very ordered compared to what things used to look like in the ancient temple. Nevertheless, the priests and, and the clergy and even the people had to be careful about carelessness in their duties. Each priest, each acolyte had specific functions and they even know how, need, needed to know how to do all of the functions because they actually rotated every day. When, when a course was on, a course was a group of men who were priests and acolytes, when, and they only came up twice. Their, their course was on for one week, twice a year. And when their course was on duty, they would actually rotate the responsibility. So one day you might be there uh, involved in the, the literal sacrifice of the animals of the sacrifice and the other forms of sacrifice. So other days you might be just cleaning up and other days you might be leading the chanting and other days you might be walking around making sure that no one was out of line and doing something that would desecrate the temple. So the temptation was carelessness in their duties. The second one was disobedience in temple instruction. Leviticus was written with al almost specifically with the temple clergy in mind. This is what they need to keep in mind. Um, and, and read Leviticus and then think about being a temple priest and, and trying to keep things in mind. And disobedience to temple instruction, if, if it's made clear what your duty is, then how do you ignore that? How, how do you not fulfill that duty? And yet there was a temptation to disobedience to temple instruction. And in the second temple, after the Babylonian captivity, everybody in the temple, in the clergy ranks understood, and even the people did too. Uh, and this, this is another story that which could lead us into something else. But they understood that 
the, the failure of the, the clergy on duty to do their duty properly affected everybody and the whole nation. So again, it was the principle of universality operative in the temple. That we don't sin in a vacuum. When we sin, all of creation is affected when each of us sins. That's why we can't take, that's why orthodoxy does not take sin lightly. You know, if, when you come into orthodoxy and these people spend too much time focusing on their sins, well, it's because we understand the magnitude of it. I like to use a prayer in my daily devotions. Uh, uh, Lord, I have sinned against you and against your creation. Have mercy on me and forgive me. Uh, because our sins affect all of creation, not just now, but in the past and in the future. That's how, 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 powerful the concept of universality is. Uh, so there's the temptation of disobedience to temple instruction. And the last one, having said all that, just unconfessed sin. What? Who cares? It's no big deal. God forgives. God is merciful. He forgives. So why do I care? <laughs> See? Why do I care? It's all taken care of. I'm saved, by golly. So... Anyway, translate that to us. And you can, you've already made the translation, I think. Uh, carelessness to our duties. All of our duties, our collective duties. And we have a variety of things from parenting to, to, to jobs, to, to our, uh, our participation here, to our spiritual duties. Uh, carelessness. Ah, who cares? You know, there's, a, there's an order that goes in creation. God first, spouse second, children third, job fourth. And we, if we keep that in order, then what we put God first, then it doesn't mean we ignore all the others. <laughs> you know, I can't say God first, uh, spouse second, and then tell her that, that I can't respond to your needs because I got to answer to God first. That's where priests go wrong and where priestly marriages break down. See, if I put God first, then his order, his demands of a priest, of anybody, means that I take care of her secondly and import just as importantly. That's, that's part of my duty to him. And if I don't put her in that order and take care of that, then I'm not putting God first. And the truth is, I deceive myself, and the truth is not in me. If you recognize that, that's one of St. John's uh, definitions of sin. <laughs> And so we have to have that order. Uh, and if we put our jobs last, it doesn't mean we're going to go to work and be slothful workers and not do our duty. We, we know God's going to expect us to give our best and to give our kids our best and to give our spouses our best and to give God our best and all others. That's the order of God first. We put everything else first and it all collapses and there's no standard that measures or guides us. And so we have carelessness to our duties, disobedience in all of its forms. And we think of disobedience as, as something intended. Oh, I don't like that commandment not to steal. By golly, I'm going to violate it because I'll do what I want. But we can steal without even knowing it. Sins known and unknown, things done and left undone. It's one of the old words or definitions. Many times we sin and we don't even know it. And so one of the aspects of Orthodox spirituality is to begin to look at ourselves in the light of God so that we can begin to find those things and correct them and begin to work on them. So we're not being disobedient in all of its forms. And lastly, just sins in general. You know, even when we do something we know that is a sin, uh, we leave it alone instead of dealing with it. The, the priests had a ritual in the ancient temple. When they found that they had committed some kind of violation of all of these expectations, they had a ritual they went through to purify themselves. And it wasn't some fake, phony thing to make them feel good about themselves. It was something which essentially changed their status and their place in, in the universality of all creation in the work of humanity. And they had to do it in order to make that right. That's why we have repentance so woven into uh, the, the thing. I notice when we do the liturgy the way we do it in the Rite of St. Tikhon, there are two basic general confessions in there. <laughs> two, uh, twice. 
And I used to think, you know, these Orthodox people, they beat everything into the ground, two, three, four, five, six, seven times, you know, 40 Kyrie's. And what's that all about? It's too much. Is it? Or is it not enough? Knowing what we know about ourselves, is it too much or is it not enough? And so as priests of creation, we have to maintain a certain focus. And let me tell you, the devil does not want any of us to accomplish this properly. When we come into the gospel, we make ourselves targets. Number one, we can either be a target of God or we can be a target of the enemy. But he doesn't want us to succeed in these things. So the temptation is already there. If God incarnate was tempted, what makes us think we're not going to be? I mean, who am I <laughs> that, that I'm not going to be tempted? And so immediately we hear temptation. What do we think? Oh, something really awful, you know, like, like drinking too much or, or, or going to strip bars or something nasty, really bad. But it, as, it was either C.S. Lewis or Peter Crave said, you know, why bother tempting them to murder when cards will do the same thing? It is true. All he's got to do, the devil's got to do, is, is throw a monkey wrench into our concentration and our focus is lost and we lose the reason why we're there and we do it for the wrong reasons. To me, it's a spiritual battle to sitting in the, in the church uh, because my mind is just, all this stuff is going on up there. And, and it's good to focus on it, but it, sometimes I can be distracted. And off I go out into left field, lost. Grace always says, earth to gym. You know? uh, because, because I get lost in my thoughts. And so we get, we get distracted. And that's all it takes to keep us from being and doing what God wants. St. Saint, Saint John then said this, the greater the holy office in which you are engaged, the more violently and the more furiously the enemy is likely to attack you. What we have to do is critical to the state of the world and the life of the world. And so we will be the focus of the devil. And we look at our world around us and we think the whole world is going to hell in a handbasket, right? Well, why? Because the devil's going after you and me. He wants us, not them, he's got them. You don't need to waste any time on people in the world. They're already out there. They're already lost. They're already deceived. He doesn't, he wants us. If you're serious about being Christian, you're marked. We're marked. We're priests. We're marked. We're in, you know, was it? You're in a heap of trouble now, boy. <laughs> we're marked. But so are you. Don't laugh and say, well, I'm glad I'm glad I'm not a priest. <laughs> you are one. That's the point we're trying to make here. You are already, and you're marked, and the devil wants you. Peter, the devil desired to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you. That wasn't just to Peter, St. Peter, it was to all of us. He said, you wish to pray, so the enemy oppresses you both spiritually and physically. You need to write a sermon so you're attacked by sloth and lassitude. Therefore, we're tempted to inactivity. You know, you, know, you know how it is? All of us have this sensation. We know we need to have a prayer discipline and a prayer regimen. And yet the minute we start to do it, everything goes wrong. If you're married, you know, you say, I'm going to set this time. Well, uh, six o'clock in the morning before anybody gets up. And what happens? For four days in a row, the kids are up at six o'clock in the morning, <laughs> screaming and hollering and fighting. Oh, so much for spiritual discipline and the resolve. And it's gone until we feel guilty. And six months later, we try it again. And for some reason, the spouse can't sleep and spouse is up at six o'clock. Uh, there's always going to be something. Or as a priest, you resolve to say your prayer time and you get emergency calls. <laughs> Not to mention your kids are acting up and your wife needs your detention. You know? Those are the emergency calls. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There's always something in there. Uh, and we can use that as an excuse. Well, I tried, but it didn't work for me. Well, yeah, that's, that's a good one. So the enemy will always oppress us spiritually and physically. So it's not, you know, physically, it can be illnesses and things like that. But those are not reasons not to have a spiritual discipline. We can adapt it to those circumstances Indeed, we should learn how to do so. 
but that doesn't excuse us. God is first in all things. All things, no matter what. He's got to be kept first, and we have to keep our place. If I'm laid out on my back, I'm still a priest to God, both as a, as a Christian and as a clergy. I still have my responsibilities. As long as I'm, I'm sane and I can utter the words, I can pray for everyone in the world up to the moment I die. So why don't I? Is it because I'm so self-absorbed that I'm thinking about, well, I, oh, I wish that this hadn't happened to me, that kind of thing. So the enemy will oppress us both spiritually and physically. We can be distracted by worldly interests. St. John said, your enemy, the evil one, the father of lies, does not slumber and endeavors by every means open to him to occupy you with worldly temporal interests. Watch yourself. Watch the thoughts of your heart and do not bind yourself in the chains of worldly desires and pleasures. So, you know, we have to, like I mentioned, I told you the story about the priest long before I became Orthodox. So <clears throat> it doesn't mean Orthodox priests don't do this, but you know, how we used to cut the service down to an hour so that everybody could be home for the Dallas Cowboys kickoff. That's a worldly concern. <clears throat> now, I want to watch the Dallas Cowboys play as much as anyone else. Yes, sir? Well, it happens when I'm alone, too. I can be halfway through the first psalm, and I'm going to run out of my vitamins. Yeah. <laughs> I need to take that right now and put it on the couch. So yeah, and if you're, if you're prone to forgetfulness, you, you're, there's a sense of urgency that has to take place right that moment. I'm learning. I'm learning. So I'm 71, and I'm just now getting the hang of this, just sort of, sort of, mind you, is to ignore those things. Uh, because, you know, I, what I do is I, all right, Lord, if I need to know this, help me to remember it because I'm not going to remember it. Uh, so, yeah. So we become, he said, we become careful and anxious about worldly, about worldly things and our hearts become engrossed in them while care and anxiety about how to please God and thought, word, and deed disappear and our hearts cease to desire God in union with him. So worldly interests, uh, responsibilities. Even hobbies, and in either the screw tape letters or the snake bite letters, I think it was Lewis who said something about hobbies work really well because they eat up our time. So anyway, worldly interests. So the devil doesn't cease. He may lay it up for a time. As it matched with the temptation of Jesus, the devil went away from him until a more opportune time, it says in some of the gospel translations. The result is the loss of interest in the realities of the spiritual life. There's nothing more important than what we do here. When the temple clergy in the ancient temple, well, I'm getting hooked up somehow here. When the ancient, they didn't have to deal with this stuff. So <laughs> that's my excuse. Uh, when the ancient temple clergy went home to their homes, their duties were not done. Uh, Every Sabbath, every Friday and Saturday mornings, they were required to say the prayers that attended the sacrifices of the Sabbath. Uh, they were to pray for all of the other clergy and keep that in mind. And that's the synagogue in Judaism actually evolved out partly out of that practice. So they didn't just get, and they had to maintain the, 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 the devotions and, and the discipline that went into keeping themselves ritually in the position to be able to do what they were assigned to do, even though it might be six months away. So then they just go home and say, oh, I take it easy today. I'm not on duty now for five, six months. They were still on duty, always. And so are we. St. John tells us we will be assailed by dryness and barrenness. He said the evil one strikes the hearts of priests with sloth, with dryness and with barrenness to present them for to prevent them from preaching the truths of the gospel to God's people, to prevent them from unfolding the entire will of God. St. John Maximovich said something that always stuck with me. He said, the mark of a true priest, and I generalize this to apply to you and all of us, the mark of the true priest is one who, who preaches as exuberantly to five people as he does to 500. That strikes home, doesn't it? Because it's so easy, though, there are only five people here. Why do I have to worry about it? I know so many priests, even Orthodox, who don't take their sermons seriously. Don't take it seriously. And it's a big, big mistake. Big mistake. 
Besides that, we don't have a choice. It's an important part of the liturgy. It's every bit as important as learning to do the rubrics correctly. That's just all the way it is. So the evil one tempts us with dryness. And we are Americans, so we understand Christianity from the perspective of the American experience. And that is that it should be sentimental and emotive and motivating. So well, it is for a while, for some of you who are new to orthodoxy, this will be all exciting for a while. But then after a while, you're going to get so comfortable with it, it's going to become routine. Then it's going to be hard to get up in the morning and make yourself be here. Because we're going to have to do it out of discipline and out of devotion to Christ, and not because we feel like it anymore. This is the temptation of the enemy. I stay home. You know, after all, you didn't. You couldn't sleep last night, or you stayed up too late watching those movies, or whatever. Or I don't feel well. You know, I'm getting old. My arthritis is bothering me. You know, I can't, just can't do it. So there's always that temptation. And then the justification that goes with it. All of these things are there, and they tempt all of us. And that when we've lost that initial impetus that we get when we first come into this, then we're more tempted to, by the routine to take things casually and not take them seriously. This is one of the struggles of the Christian life. And all of the Christian traditions outside of orthodoxy also attest to this. So we have words like the dark night, phrases like the dark night of the soul. Uh, we have words like aridities. That's a good one. It's arid. Yeah, Lord, it really is arid. It is dry and barren, like the psalm, in a dry, land, barren land where no water is. And we have to get up and find God in the middle of all that. I find it interesting that the monks in the early centuries in the Middle East went out into the desert to find God and to enter into the struggle of a spiritual life. The desert, where there is no water and where it is barren and dry. And there they found life. So when, when the faith spread to Russia, where'd they go? They didn't have deserts in Russia, at least not in the main part of Russia. So they went to the woods, out into the forest. That was the Russian version of the desert. And among the Celts, they didn't have deserts either, but they had islands. So they went to the islands, alienated, rough winds, no trees, nothing, and lived there. The Irish have a humorous little anecdote. They call the islands the desert in the ocean. There's more truth to that than you know. And so anyway, it will get boring and routine. And the enemy will take advantage of it. <clears throat> He'll want us to give up, to stop. Just interfere with our work. Keep us from doing this consistently. To prevent us from achieving what Christ desires for us. There is then a temptation, and I think I've already alluded to this, to believe that all our efforts are a waste of time. You know, we feel like we're not making any progress. He said, the enemy may try to disconcert your heart and mind and to quench the words of your lips by the thought that the people do not understand much of what you are saying and that to read such prayers is a useless waste of time. So why bother? You're not getting anywhere. You've been working on this issue for a long time. But I want to tell you, I found... Sometimes it takes 20 years and suddenly the light goes on and God gets in, suddenly does something and makes some progress with me and my hard Irish head. Uh, and then all the doors open. And if I'd quit, I never would have gotten there. Never. I remember asking, I think I might have mentioned this once early on in another lesson, but I remember asking in the 70s, asking God to explain to me why he needs a sacrifice for sin. And I never got an answer until about five years ago. So, and, and, and the answer is not complete. I feel like I made clear to me that there was more to come. <laughs> and I was gonna, it was gonna take a while. But the fact of the matter is some of these things take forever and that's okay. We're on the scope of eternity. We've left chronological time and entered into chronological time that is itself a participation in eternity. So it's okay. We want to enter into that. But the devil wants us to say, oh, you don't have much time for this. You know, as we get older, we start, 
calculating how many years we have left, you know, and there's a temptation for me to say, well, I, all my people seem to live into their mid 80s. So I got about 15 years left and that's not very much. And I might want to get on the bandwagon and start moving things forward. Well, yes, but not much I can do except do my duty. Anyway, tempt us to believe that all our works are a waste of time, that all we're doing is a waste of time. And then finally, he says, in order not to fail and to sin, we must prepare ourselves for all our tasks by intelligent study, combined with prayer and abstinence, striving after perfection in all things. If, nevertheless, we do fail, we must not allow ourselves to be overwhelmed with shame and despondency, but must throw aside our self-centeredness, humble ourselves before God, acknowledge our infirmity and our sin, and without shame, confess our slothfulness, our carelessness, or our weakness. I would suggest that there are two uses of the word shame here. If you have read any Father Zacharias and Elder Sophroni, you will know this. Uh, one is a worldly shame. Well, we, I don't want to face the fact that I'm a sinner and that I commit sins and I'm ashamed of that. And the other is a spiritual shame that before God, we want to offer him the best and we realize we can't and we're ashamed before God. You know, the worldly shame is I don't want you to know what a, what a, what a lowly sinner I am because I'm ashamed of that. So I don't want you to know. So if I can create an image of sanctity uh, that will somehow fool you, then I won't have to face that shame. But real shame is to be before God and be ashamed. Lord, I have sinned. And I do this again and again and again. We're all in that same boat. <laughs> so the other, the other shame is simply self-delusion. Yes, sir. Um, going back, you said despondency. Mm -hmm. Despondency, sin in itself, too, to be despondent instead of. Yes. Instead yeah. Of yeah. But going remember, forward like you're talking about. yes. But remember that sin, we have a tendency in America to think of sin as, as malicious behavior. And sin is any behavior that does not measure up, that falls short of the mark of God, that does not open us to God. So even some of our best actions can be sin, you know, in marriage. All you guys know this who are married. You, you, you open your mouth one day and out come these words that mean something really nice to you and your wife is awesome. off. Yeah, you're offended and hurt. And you're going, what happened here? What happened here? You know, yeah. And, and so you're, yeah, your well-intentioned behavior fell short of the mark. And therefore it's a sin, although it wasn't malicious. Like saying something ugly to your spouse, that would be malicious. So we have to understand the sin is like that. Sometimes we mean well, we just don't measure up. We fall short. And so we meant well. We come here because we mean well. But there's more to it than just that. A whole lot more. So we, we sin. We fall short of the mark. We fail. It's important to understand that for all of us. And the things that, that work that we have to do that correct that are prayer, obvious, having a regimented prayer time. Remember St. John got up every morning at 4.30 to say his prayers and to go to mass <laughs> every day because he understood the importance of that. And then study. There's a whole lot to learn. And there's there this church has, all, has something for all of us. <laughs> I mean, there's something for all of us. So we can say, well, I'm not academic. Well, you don't have to be. There's stuff out there that's not non-academic. I remember somebody telling me, one lady telling me, well, I'm not a reader. Well, you have all this stuff you can listen to in the car. You know, the technology today is wonderful in some, in some ways. I think it's demonic in some ways too, but then I don't like it very much. So, but anyway, there, there, is, there is stuff, audio, there's audio material that one can listen to. We're talking about the saints. There are saints for everybody, male, female, old, young, uh, whatever race in the world there is, there's a, there's a saint for that person. Many of them. Everybody. There's always something. It's all there. And we need to study these people. It's much to be learned from them. And abstinence. Abstinence as a physical food discipline affects the whole of our spiritual lives. If we learn to control what we eat, we learn to control everything. Many of the fathers said that... The, Eating is the door to the passions. So we learn to control that. We learn something about controlling our passions. And when we control our passions, 
we begin to win this victory. And then striving after perfection, striving. We, the goal is to become like Christ. Be ye holy as your heavenly Father is holy. Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus said that. That's a command, not a suggestion. <laughs> Lord, how can I be perfect or holy? I mean, look at me. You know it. I know it. The American people know it. You know, it's that way. So the temptations of the priest, of all of us, are demonic attacks. It's going to happen. Sloth and, and, and some people say, well, I don't believe in that devil stuff. Well, if you read the screw tape letters and the snake bite letters, you'll find the devil said, that's perfect. Don't believe it. You're mine. So Jesus believed it. People who wrote the Gospels believed it. So good enough for them, good enough for me, and they're a whole lot smarter than I am. So... Besides that, my experience tells me that he's real. So demonic attacks, sloth, especially if one is inclined towards sloth. Temporal concerns, as we've already mentioned. Dryness, barrenness, worldly scrupulosity. You know, we can be so enamored of getting everything right out there. And this thing is a shambles and a mess. I... I had the experience of working under a, a priest who kept a dirty sanctuary. And I mean, it was dusty and dirty and wax all over the floor and papers lying around, investments not put away and things like this. And I got really critical. You know, I'd stand there and just to stew, you know, why well, there's no excuse for this and on and on. And then one day, a voice, and I think I was sitting down for some reason, but a voice inside of me said, take a long look at this and then look at yourself. So I looked inside and all I thought was this whole room was an icon of this mess right here. Uh, and this mess was bad, real bad, much worse than, than, the, than the dirty sanctuary, <laughs> much worse. And remember, the temple is threefold, eternity, the, the, the place where this cat happens, and here. All three, always all three. So, <clears throat> worldly scrupulosity. I was worried about his mistakes and not looking at my own. And avoidance of repentance. Repentance is one of the hardest disciplines for us as Christians. And yet it's funny how if you read Orthodox saints' writings, they're all obsessed with repentance. So either they're crazy and have obsessive compulsive personalities and, and, and unresolved guilt and all the other stuff you can come up with. They're either that or they're right. If they're right, then what do we have to learn? A whole lot. St. John thought that repentance was important. St. John Maximovich thought repentance was important. All the great saints thought repentance was important. There must be something to that. So what do we do? Well, expect temptations. And having said that, try to be vigilant again against anything that would lead us astray from our task. Strive to experience what is believed. To experience what is believed. We are entering into God. So this is not about just head knowledge. It's about the person of the divine who will give us head knowledge, but it will be an, an all-encompassing knowledge. We want to enter into that, encounter God. When we come here, we should expect to encounter him. You know, I was struck again this morning. I always do at the beginning of this, this Western Rite Mass, as opposed even to the Eastern Rite Mass. You have the ninefold Kyrie, and I can't help but be affected by the fact that I'm standing there. We all are standing there. And we're crying out on behalf of all the universe and all of history. Lord, have mercy on us. Uh, and it, it was almost as if this morning, as if everybody got that all at the same time. And that's the way it felt. Uh, and so, Lord, have mercy upon us. And that's, that's the universality in its best. Uh, it was there. Oh, it's drawn into it. And so easy to, to be vigilant, to want to be vigilant for that. And then there was the next part, the glory and excelsis. Glory be to God on high. Representing the angels singing the hymn of the incarnation to the whole world. This world is not the same if we do this because the collective whole has one group right over here 
and a few others spread around who are doing this and saying this. That's how important it is. So we want to strive to experience what is believed and strive to a desire a longing for God. This is what St. John wanted. Remember, his book's called My Life in Christ. That's not just terminology. It's a life in Christ. Avoid worldly thoughts and distractions as much as possible. This will be a combat. This will be a desert. This will be a struggle. We all will have them. <clears throat> be generous in almsgiving, he would say. And notice how he started hospitals and all this. Not so that we could end poverty. Because we're never going to end poverty. Jesus said, the poor you will have with you always. But because he said, do it. And so we will. And it will transform what it will help to transform what begins to happen in us and what needs to happen in us. And lastly, learning to do these things affects the priest's person and resist helps us to resist temptation. So do these things. You know, people say want a simple answer or what they want a complex answer. And it's a simple answer. Do these things and do them persistently, and things will begin to change. <coughs> and not only will things begin to change, but we will begin to find ourselves somewhere else while still here. And that's really important. That collect I started with today was the collect for whole Easter Monday. I want to read it again because I think it sums up what this whole life is all about. O God, who at the feast of the Passover didst give unto the world the medicine of salvation, Increase, we beseech thee, the use of all these thy saving remedies among thy people, that they may be healed of spiritual ills and endued with the quickening power of life eternal. We do those things, we'll open ourselves to God, and he will fill us with himself, and everything will be different. Everything. I think John, St. John, the Kronstadt, he caught that. And he left us a legacy so that we could enter into it too, and we can. Thank you. Now, if you have questions, we'll... I don't know how I'm doing it. I wish I could remember the priest. Forgive me for not remembering who it was that said this. It was about five years ago I heard this. And you, you talk about the consistency. And, and he, I remember he said, the way that we live in the daily, each day we're, mm -hmm. either, we're either digging deeper ruts into this earth or brick by brick paving the path to paradise. Mm -hmm. And that's all about the patterns. It's all about what we choose to do in the daily. One of the two is inevitably happening. And that's what I thought about that when you were saying. Yep. It's interesting. You know, God doesn't, I like to say that God doesn't waste anything. So all our efforts are used. All of our experiences, all our failures. He works everything together for the good. Nothing is wasted. So when we're wailing and lamenting about why this is happening to me and why this, is, we got to remember that God is going to change those things and transform them. If if one of us can stand up here and say something and, and give you a witness, it's it's because you know what if the experience comes from good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. <laughs> you know, here's the master of bad judgment right here. So. <laughs> Sinner of whom I am chief. Say, good enough for St. Paul. <laughs> Father, I'd like to say one thing. I think that God puts us in places that we didn't intend to go for his purpose, and then we find out why he put us there so that we could either benefit from someone else or we could give benefit to someone else because of him through us. Or be a part of something which transcends us. Right. You know, like, like, I like to tell this story, and I, I don't think I've told it here, but uh, sometimes God uses us to be a, a, a simple piece in a greater picture. And we look at it as, I've got to be the end of that picture. And that's sin. I've got to be that picture. Sometimes it's a greater picture, and each one of us is just a little tiny piece in that puzzle. And the two examples that I think of are from the Roman Catholic Sanctorum, the Roman Catholic saints. One is, one is a fellow named Alfred the Great. He's now known as Saint Alfred the Great. Albert, not Alfred, Albert. Albertus Magnus, he's called in Latin. 
And Albert was a professor at a university where he taught theology, Roman Catholic theology. <coughs> and he, he taught a young student named Thomas Aquinas. And Aquinas learned what Albert had to say all too well. And he wound up being the standard of the theological standard for all Roman Catholic priests and, and people wanting that, that education up until Vatican II when they changed the ruling. You can always tell an old school Roman Catholic priest because he spouts Aquinas without even knowing it. <laughs> uh, he thinks and breathes Aquinas. Somewhere along the line, Albert was not known. Probably none of you have ever heard of him. But somewhere along the line, the church realized how important his role was in the life of the church. And so they elevated him to the status of a saint because of his contributions to, to Roman Catholicism. The other one was a monk named Stephen Harding. I'm sure you haven't heard of him either. Uh, Stephen Harding was an abbot in England. And he had a monastery, and the monastery was beset by the bubonic plague, and a number of the monks died. <coughs> they were down to about five of them. And he was in despair and depressed, just as any of us would be. Lord, what's going on? Just totally depressed by the whole scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, one day, they got a knock on the door. And they opened the door, and here was a guy with 30 men. And he said, the Lord has sent me to you to be trained by you. So he took him in, and the guy turned out to be Bernard of Clairvaux. You've all heard of Saint Bernard. You don't know who Stephen Harding is. He too was made a saint, a saint after the, the fact because of his contribution. Now that's the Roman Catholic Church, but that's those are two examples of how important were their contributions. Yeah, you know, we don't know who they were. Would we be happy to be unknown like that? in order to contribute to the greater picture with such a magnificent degree? Well, if we knew it, yeah. So I could tell all you how I've succeeded. <laughs> I want you to know. It doesn't work that way. The lesser are the greater. And, and we go toward, we go down to humility, which they did. So anyway, more? You had one. Did you get it answered? Yeah. Gary? Oh, so, what are there checkpoints that you usually would work with, like to think of, like, you know, instead of study or prayer, but, you know, it's like, you know, like you, like you find yourself in the instance of sin, that uh, shakes your wear like that. You know, how, how do you, is there checkpoints that you use in place that you don't? Like veer off, you know what the good. You know, I'm thinking like the Pharisees, you know, when they talk to Jesus, he's like, you search the scriptures, and like, here I am, or they're doing all, they doing prayers, but they're doing it wrong, and they do, you know, just still good, but the good yeah. things, they're doing it wrong. You know, how do you, what checkpoints do you have? This, like, this is what I think. So I'm answering that question from my perspective, so understand that. But I think it is also the Orthodox perspective. What I look for, is like, like reading books on orthodox spirituality, or orthodoxy in general. I don't want a book, I don't care how right it is and how orthodox it is, I don't want a book that doesn't introduce me to God. And that's the key for me. That's why I like Losky, because the first thing I ever read from him is all theology is and it stems from an encounter with God. <laughs> One sentence, that was the whole book. All theology stems from an encounter with God. We can have theology, so to speak, uh, fancy religious thinking without ever talking about God, without ever meeting him, without ever encountering him. In fact, in orthodoxy, theology is a description, what we say about theos, God. So how do you say something about God without experiencing him, encountering him? So I look for the writers who, who, who write about these things and I'm overwhelmed academically and intellectually, but my soul is drawn into what they say and into a greater place, something greater. So for me, that's it. Does this introduce me to God? I read a book, reread a book recently. Someone had given to me once. It was a rage in orthodoxy about 10 years ago. I won't mention the book. But I was given a copy of the book by a nun who said, you really have to read this. It's a big deal. So I read it, and I didn't get anything out of it. So I thought recently I'd reread it because I thought maybe I missed something. Uh, and I read the book. And yeah, I got some things out of it, but it was all academic. 
I did not feel like the writer introduced me to Christ. I read Father Zacharias' new book, Monasticism, and I was sucked in. <laughs> I mean, I was caught, and every page was being, like being enwrapped. And so, and at the same time, he was teaching me monasticism. He was teaching me orthodox spirituality. He was teaching me all kinds of things. But I was being drawn in. And when, when we do this, that's what should happen. I mean, it wouldn't be enough for me to sit up here and tell you, well, you know, you ought to have a prayer time. I, I, I'm, we're trying to set you up for being drawn in because we need to be drawn in, all of us. Open ourselves to God and let him take us, catch us. So, yeah, I would say, I would say. So remember, remember that. Maybe I didn't get that guy's book because there's something dense in me. I don't know. That's not impossible. Uh, but I always look for, does this introduce me to God? That's the question I ask. So if you ask me about a book to read, that's one of the things that's on my mind. <laughs> okay. So not everything out there is, is for us all, I don't think. What else? All right. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.